Hello and welcome back. Today I want to continue looking at RF power amplifiers and analyze the class E topology. Similar to the class D, this is also a switching amplifier, but it does come with some special perks, like improved efficiency and the possibility to be built using a single switching element. So if you're curious about that much more, then keep watching. So we previously analyzed why a transistor used as a switch is more efficient than one used in the linear mode of operation. The switching transistor is either on conducting when you are dissipating power because of the current passing through it, or it is off or blocking when there is no current so no power dissipation. And well, some power is lost during the transition between the two states. But the total power dissipation during a complete switching cycle is usually way less than what is achieved during a similar linear operating cycle. This is why the class D amplifier is considered more efficient than a class C amplifier. So how do you make an even better amplifier? Well, there's not much you can do about the losses when the transistor is fully on, current does need to go through it, but you can improve on the transitions. So the basic type of single transistor class C amplifier is built as follows. You have a switch and a current limiting inductor, which together drive a resonant network, after which the final load is connected. Now the switch needs to be driven with a signal, which is a square wave, with a 50% duty cycle at the operating frequency. And to make things nice and complicated, the resonant network has two resonance frequencies, neither of which is the operating frequency. The benefit of building the circuit this way is that you can get zero voltage switching on both turn on and turn off edges of the input signal, but also on the turn on edge you achieve zero current switching. And while on the turn off edge, although the current isn't zero, it's not really the maximum achievable level. So the end result is that the switch will be operating with reduced losses during the transition phases. This is where the improved efficiency of this type of amplifier comes from. Now the class E amplifier can be built in multiple ways. The version you will most commonly come across uses a single switching transistor with a resonant network using a parallel capacitor and while a radio frequency choke through which the circuit is supplied. Now you can also use a parallel inductor. So rather than using a large radio frequency choke, use that inductor as part of the resonant network. But this only works if the built-in capacitance of the switch, so its parallel capacitance, is very small. So that's why this version is not all that common. But anyway, you can combine two basic stages and create push-pull arrangements when you need higher power levels. So for this of course you will need two driving signals which are 180 degrees phase shifted, so this will be similar to a class D amplifier. However, out of all of these variants, the key advantage of the class E amplifier is that it can be built with one single switching transistor. So this parallel capacitor version is the one that I will be focusing on today. Now the theoretical analysis of the class C, D and E amplifiers tells us that all of them can achieve 100% of efficiency. But that cannot really happen in practice. However, practical class D amplifiers can be made more efficient than class C amplifiers and practical class E amplifiers can be built to be more efficient than class D amplifiers. So to better understand the circuit and the benefits, let's try to design one. So as before, I will try to make an amplifier that outputs half a watt into a 50 ohm load and the operating frequency will be set to 5 MHz and the supply to 5 volts. And for this, we will need to calculate the various elements of the typical single transistor class E circuit. So I don't want to go into too many details with the formulas. There are five main design equations. I found them in the documentation mentioned in the video description. So if you want to know more, go check that out. And the components that you get from these might not be perfect, but they do represent a very good starting point from which to fine tune the final design. So first we need to determine the load into which we can drive the necessary power. This is not really the load that we want. So we will need some impedance matching later on. Next, your radio frequency choke, your buffer inductor, needs to be relatively large. So 
so a minimum value can be determined, but I will use a standard 100 microfenry inductor just to be on the safe side. And then for the next calculation, you need to establish a Q factor for the resonance circuit. So typical values will be somewhere between three and 10. I will be going with the value of 10. And while using this, the other elements of the resonance circuit can be determined. Now, before moving on to the matching circuit, let's first make sure that this bit actually works. So for that, I prepared the calculated components in the circuit simulator. LT spice as always. Now, for the transistor, first I'm using an idealized switch, something that has a 1 milliohm on resistance, and I'm doing this just to keep things simple. And as driving signal, I'm using a 5 MHz square wave that has a 50% duty cycle. So if we run this thing, have a look at the output, well, first of all, we can see that it takes a while for the output oscillation to build up. It's not instantaneous. So to get a better picture of the steady state operation, we can modify our simulation command to start recording only after a certain amount of time. So just to skip the initial build up phase, and well, to get nice and clean sine waves, I also added in this maximum time step of 0.1 nanoseconds. So if we rerun like this, we can see our nice output sine wave, and we can also check the delivered power, which is about 520 milliwatts. So around the value that we've started to design with. At the same time, we can also check the input power, again, 520 something milliwatts, so both of these are more or less equal, and that's perfectly normal with ideal components. And next, we can look at the switches operation. So starting off from the control signal, the voltage on the switch and the current running through the switch. We can observe first of all our zero voltage switching. So when the switch is turning off, the voltage starts from zero, and then when the switch turns on, the voltage again is around zero. And well, for the current, if we ignore these current spikes, we can see that at one of the transitions, current starts from zero. And well, at the other transition, even though current isn't zero, it's not the maximum value either. So having these features are the key elements that ensure the high efficiency of the class E operation. Final thing to observe, if we look at the voltage on the switch, is the exact value of this. So even though we're using a five volt supply, the voltage on the switch is exceeding 18 volts. And this is an important thing to observe when choosing the practical components, since the exact transistor that you will end up using has to be able to withstand four to five times the supply voltage just to be on the safe side. Now, to better analyze the output cleanliness and bandwidth, I prepared two circuits. So one which uses the components that we designed when we set the Q factor to be 10, and another one where the Q factor was set to be free. So the same formulas were used to design these component values. If we run the two circuits and look at the output waveforms, maybe just zoom in a bit, we can already see that the waveform for the Q factor of three, so the blue one, isn't as sine wavy as the other one. But of course we can get a better look if we perform an FFT analysis. So we can see that both of these signals has the same fundamental, more or less, but the harmonics on the output of the amplifier with the Q factor of three are much, much larger. This means that it's far more distorted. So in essence, going for a higher Q factor will mean you get a cleaner output wave. But at the same time, when you're going for lower harmonics, the thing that you are giving up is bandwidth. So to highlight this, we can rerun the circuit three times, amplifying three different frequencies. So the initial five megahertz and then plus minus 200 kilohertz. So if we plot out the two outputs when amplifying different frequency signals, we can see that when we have a Q factor of only three, although the output amplitude does vary, it doesn't vary that much when we compare it to the Q factor of 10. So the lower the Q factor is, the less attenuated the signals will be when they are at a different frequency than the initial one for which you've designed the circuit for. So even though the class E amplifier is a narrow band type of amplifier, just how narrow band it is can be controlled by the circuit design. Final thing that's worth mentioning about the initial circuit and the component values is that even though the formulas are useful to get started with, they might not end up giving the best values since there are quite a bit of assumptions and simplifications behind them. The way in which you can judge how well the circuit is designed is based on the exact waveform which is found in the switching node. 
So ideally, this should be the red line. It should look like three quarters of a sine wave where the switch turns on just as the voltage reaches exactly zero. If the voltage looks different, it's either higher or lower somewhere, then the resonant elements need to be varied a bit until you are closer to the ideal operation. Based on the exact modification that you need to bring to your waveform, each of the components will have an impact on it. So you will either have to work on the output load or the free elements in the resonance circuit so that you can get the ideal waveform. So starting off from the two circuits that have different Q values, if we run the simulation and have a look into the switching node, so on the one side the circuit with the Q factor of 10, on the other the circuit with the Q factor of 3, we can see that neither of these have the ideal waveform. So the one with Q10 is undershooting, so this minimal point should be at zero, whereas the other circuit is switching sometime after this minimum point is achieved, and while it's also undershooting. So with a bit of trial and error, I started to modify the various values, and by doing this, the circuit with the Q factor of 10, I managed to get it to have the end of the waveform almost close to zero, whereas for the other circuit, again a similar result. So the ideal here is not to have a maximum peak amplitude, but rather to tightly control the moment when the switches are, well, switching. Now one way in which you can confirm that the circuit is working better is to look at the current running through the switch. So with our initial circuit with the Q factor of 10, we had our current waveform, but we also had this massive spike when the switch was turning on. With the improved version of the circuit, the spike is much, much smaller. So we went from a value of about 4.5 amperes down to about 200 milliamperes. In the same way, if we look at the other circuit, again, we have this massive spike at about nine amperes, and after adjustments, it again went down to around 200 milliamperes. So the values are not perfect, but it's way better. Moving forward from our amplifier, we need to match its output impedance of 28.85 ohms to our target of 50. So let's now add the matching network. So I will be going with a T type of matching network, which matches the 28.85 to the output 50. And I designed the component values using a Q factor of three. For this, I used the online calculator, which is linked below, of course. And well, the nice thing about this type of network is that we can combine the two inductors. So the first one from the network with the one existing already in our amplifier. So the final circuit that we end up with has one fewer components. If we now move back to the circuit simulator, I have the initial circuit, which was designed for the 29 ohm output load, as well as the one in which we added in the matching circuit. So the one that outputs into 50 ohms. If we run the circuit to check how they both behave, we can look at the two power levels. So we have 498.8 milliwatts into the 29 ohm load and 498.7 milliwatts into the 50 ohm load. So more or less, they are identical. Now, another thing we can look at is just how clean the output waveform is. So we can do this, of course, with an FFT analysis. So before adding in the output matching, we had the green waveform where we see quite large harmonics. Whereas after adding in the matching circuit, it also doubles as a filter, we can see the harmonics are far more reduced. Now granted, we still have about 43 decibels between the fundamental and the highest harmonic, and this may or may not be enough for your application. So if further filtering is needed, that of course is application dependent. So far, so good. The simulated circuit is working as expected, but this is using ideal components. How well does it actually work when you use real components? Specifically, a real transistor, since most of the dissipated power in a real life amplifier gets dissipated there. Now, for the practical build, I will be going with the SI2304 and channel MOSFET, which comes in quite a small SOT23 package, but considering the huge amounts of efficiency that we're targeting, this should not be a problem. Also worth mentioning is that the maximum drain source voltage for this component is 30 volts, which is six times the supply voltage that we're using, so we should be completely safe with this component. And also, more importantly, the manufacturer of this component also provides a SPICE model for it. So we can easily insert this into the simulation and see how the circuit should behave 
in our practical build. So for that, I took a copy of our previously analyzed circuit and simply swapped out the switch with our transistor. And of course, the signal source was changed a bit, so we're going from 0 to 5 volts, so just so we have enough to drive the transistor. And also to get the realistic signal driving, I also added in a series resistance. So if we run the simulation, see what happens, we can start off by looking at the output waveform. So we can see that with our transistor circuit it's slightly smaller. And another good indication would be to look at the switching node. So this is our reference circuit. And with the transistor, well it doesn't look as it's supposed to. So we can see that the waveform is falling and then suddenly going to zero. So we are switching too early. Now one of the things that we haven't considered yet is that the transistor already has some output capacitance other than the 220 picofarads that we already have in the circuit. So one of the things mentioned in the datasheet is the output capacitance, which is typically 67 picofarads for this component. So if we make another copy of the circuit and also take into consideration this capacitance, so we should only use 153 picofarads, the other 67 is in the transistor already, and we rerun the simulation to check the behavior, we can see that by adding in this smaller capacitor, we have a nicer waveform. It's slightly larger, and while well, the output again is larger. So even though we subtracted some capacitance, this might not be the ideal value, since the capacitance in the datasheet was measured under different conditions than what we are using. So this exact capacitance value might need a bit of fine tuning. So I went ahead and reduced it some more, down to 90 picofarads. If we do this, we can see that our waveform almost goes down to zero, so this should be a much better value, and while well, we have a larger output waveform. So with this final circuit, we can check the output power, exactly 500 milliwatts, and the input power is 532 milliwatts. Now, even though this is not perfect, we're still at 94% of efficiency, which is extremely good. So with a bit of fine tuning, you might end up with some better values. Now, one more interesting thing to observe is that if we look at the current running through the transistor, we can see that it never really goes to zero. I mean, it even goes negative, it has positive values, so we're not really getting the behavior that we were expecting from the ideal switch. And the main reason for this being that part of the capacitance in the resonant circuit is inside of the transistor. So in the red trace, we're not just seeing the current running through the switch, we're also seeing current running through the capacitance. So this sort of behavior is perfectly normal. In the end, the class E amplifier is an interesting topology offering superior efficiency and low component count. Even though it's a narrow band amplifier, its use cases are similar to those of class C and class D amplifiers. And while well, the exact bandwidth can be made quite wide based on the exact design details. Now, the circuit that we looked at today seems to work just fine in the circuit simulator. But the true test is a real build. And that is a topic for next time. For now, hope you got some useful information out of this, leave your thoughts in the comments, thank you for watching, make sure to subscribe to be updated on my videos, and see you next time. Bye bye.